Hi, like in eighth grade. This is Miss McQueen. Hope everyone is doing well and that you conquered lesson one. Some of you might have already read ahead in our book, especially those of you who sought out a specific answer to number eight on the text dependent questions from lesson one. Poland mentions the four food chains on page 12. Uh, we'll make sure to give you better hints in the future about that so we don't run into any issues. If you are still struggling to adjust to virtual learning or need more help navigating Google Classroom, please email your ELA teacher. We want to make sure that everyone can access what they need. And now on to our next lesson. For lesson two, we will be focusing on a larger chunk of reading for the omnivore's dilemma. Activity number one, read pages 11 through 13 and 17 through 36 of the omnivore's dilemma. On Google Classroom, you may use the larger PDF or the smaller PDF with just the assigned reading to complete this activity. Now pay close attention to this next part. If you would like to listen along to an audio version of this reading, please keep watching the video. Mrs. Kessinger recorded her reading the PDF for both parts. Please feel free to stop the video when I'm done giving instructions or you may use the timestamps in the description of the video to skip ahead to the parts you'd like to hear read aloud. Okay, this is super important now to pay attention to. This next activity is for second period McQueen, Genovese, and Kessinger, and eighth period Genovese. Do not do this next activity if you are a different class period. Okay, activity number two, focus questions. On Google Classroom, find the post for activity number two. Depending on your ELA teacher, this will either be a Google Doc or discussion question post. And use the strongest evidence from the text to answer the questions. Which of Michael Pollan's food chains does the meal you chose at the beginning of lesson one best match? And why do you think that? Okay, for all other eighth grade ELA classes, this is your next activity. Activity number two, chapters one through two summary. On Google Classroom, after reading chapters one through two of Omnivore's Lemma, pages 17 through 36, please write a four to six sentence summary of what you read using the attached Google Doc. Make sure that you express the main idea of both chapters and include supporting details that are relevant. Write in complete sentences. You will also answer the focus question at the bottom of the document. You have now completed lesson two and you have finished your first week of virtual learning for ELA. Please stay tuned for any Google Meets that your ELA teacher might schedule. Remember, you can email us or leave comments on Google Classroom. Now, keep watching the video if you'd like to listen to the audio version of the book. Bye. Hello, eighth grade. Um, for Wednesday, you are going to be reading chapters one and two of Omnivore's Dilemma. Uh, this, this is pages 17 through 36. Um, you are welcome to read it on your own and I will post that on Google Classroom. However, I also decided to do a read aloud for those that would like to hear that instead. So here we go. Chapter one, how corn took over America, a field of corn. The average supermarket doesn't seem much like a field of corn. Take a look around one. What do you see? There's a large air conditioned room. There are long aisles and shelves piled high with boxes and cans. There are paper goods and diapers and magazines, but that's not all. Look again. Somewhere behind the brightly colored packaging, underneath the labels covered with information, there is a mountain of corn. You may not be able to see it, but it's there. I'm not talking about the corn in the produce section. That's easy to recognize. In the spring and summer, the green ears of corn sit out in plain view with the other fruits and vegetables. You can see a stack of ears next to the eggplants, onions, apples, bananas, and potatoes. But that's not a mountain of corn, is it? Keep looking. Go through the produce to the back of the supermarket and you'll find the meats. There's corn here too, but it's a little harder to see. Where is it? Here's a hint. What did the cows and pigs and chickens eat before they became cuts of meat? Mainly corn. Go a little further. There's still a lot of corn hiding in the supermarket. How about those long aisles of soft drinks made from corn? The freezer case stuffed with TV dinners, mostly corn. Those donuts and chips, cookies and chips, 
They're made with a whole lot of corn. Supermarkets look like they contain a huge variety of food. The shelves are stuffed with thousands of different items. There are dozens of different soups and salad dressings, cases stuffed with frozen dinners and ice cream and meat. The range of food choices is amazing. Yet, if you look a little closer, you begin to discover it's all corn. Well, maybe not all corn, but there's still an awful lot of it hiding here, a lot more than you'd suspect. We think of our supermarkets as offering a huge variety of food. You know, most of that huge variety comes from one single plant. How can this be? Corn is what feeds the steer that becomes your steak. Corn feeds the chickens and the pig. Corn feeds the catfish raised in a fish farm. Corn fed chickens lay the eggs. Corn feeds the dairy cows that produce the milk, cheese, and ice cream. See those chicken nuggets in the freezer case? They are really corn wrapped up in more corn. The chicken was fed corn. The batter is made from corn flour. The starch that holds it together is corn starch. The oil it was fried in was corn oil. But that's not all. Read the label on any bag of chips, candy bar, or frozen snacks. How many ingredients do you recognize? Maltodextrin, monosodium glutamate, absorbic acid. What are those things? What about lecithin and mono-D and triglycerides? They are all made from corn. The golden food coloring, made from corn. Even the citric acid that keeps the nugget fresh is made from corn. If you wash down your chicken nuggets with almost any soft drink, you are drinking corn with your corn. Since the 1980s, almost all sodas and most of the fruit drinks sold in the supermarket are sweetened with something called high fructose corn syrup. Read the label on any processed food and the corn is what you'll find. Corn is the non-dairy creamer and the cheese whiz, the frozen yogurt, and the TV dinner, the canned fruit, and the ketchup. It's in the candy, the cake mixes, the mayonnaise, the mustard, hot dogs, and bologna, the salad dressings, and even in some vitamins. Yes, it's in a Twinkie too. There are some 45,000 items in the average American supermarket, and more than a quarter of them now contain corn. This goes for non-food items as well, everything from toothpaste and cosmetics to disposable diapers, trash bags, and even batteries. Corn is in places you would never think to look. It's in the wax that coats the other vegetables in the produce section. It goes into the coating that makes the cover of a magazine shine. It's even in part of the supermarket building because the wallboard, the flooring, and many other building materials are made with corn. Carbon from corn. You are what you eat, it's often said. If this is true, then what we are today is mostly corn. This, this isn't just me being dramatic. It's something that scientists have been able to prove. How do they do this? by tracing the element carbon as it goes from the atmosphere into plants, then into our food, and finally into us. You may have heard the expression that humans are a carbon-based life form. This always seems to come up in science fiction movies, but it's true. Like hydrogen and oxygen, carbon is an element, one of the basic building blocks of matter. All the molecules that make up our cells, carbohydrates, proteins, and fats, contain the element carbon. All of the carbon in our bodies was originally floating in the air as part of a carbon dioxide molecule. Plants take the carbon out of carbon dioxide and use it to make food, carbohydrates. They do this through a process called photosynthesis. In photosynthesis, plants use the energy of the sun. Photo means light to synthesize, make food. All of our food, in fact, almost all of life on earth can be traced back to photosynthesis in plants. It's more than a figure of speech to say that plants create life out of thin air. So the plants take carbon and make it into food. Then we eat the plants or we eat the animals that have eaten the plants. That's how carbon winds up in our cells. But not all carbon is the same. Corn uses slightly different types of carbon than other plants. So by looking at the type of carbon in our cells, scientists can tell how much corn we have been eating. Todd Dawson, a biologist at the University of California, Berkeley, has done exactly that kind of research. He says that when you look at the carbon in the average American cells 
We look like corn chips with legs. Americans don't think of themselves as corn eaters. Our bread is made from wheat flour. We don't eat a lot of corn on the cob. When we think of serious corn eaters, we often think of people in Mexico. About 40% of their calories come directly from corn, mostly in the form of corn tortillas. Yet Americans have more corn in their diet than Mexicans. It's just that the corn we eat wears many different disguises. How did corn take over America? It's really a tremendous success story, for corn anyway. Corn has managed to become the most widely planted crop in America. More than 80 million, million acres of farmland are planted with corn every year. Today, it covers more acres of the country than any other living species, including human beings. It has pushed other plants and animals off the American farm. It has managed to push a lot of farmers off the farm. I'll explain that one later. Corn is now one of the most successful plants on earth. It's important to the remember that while humans use plants and other animals, it is not a one-way street. Plants and animals don't just sit around waiting for human beings to use them. They use us too. The ones that can adapt use our farms and cities to spread and multiply. Corn became king of the farm and the supermarket because it adapted itself easily to the needs of farmers and food makers. It had qualities that humans, human beings prized. Those qualities allowed it to spread and grow until it worked its way into every corner of our lives and every cell in our bodies. The Rise of Maize When Columbus returned to Spain after his first voyage, he described many wonderful things he had seen to Queen Isabella. One of his discoveries was a towering grass with an ear as thick as a man's arm, to which grains were affixed in a wondrous manner in form and size like garden peas, white when young. That grass was called maize, but today we know it as corn. Corn began as a wild grass called teosinte. Teosinte means mother of corn in the Native American language. Teosinte still grows wild in some places in Central America, but if you saw it, you might not recognize it as the mother of corn. Teosinte ears are no bigger than your thumb. They are not covered in thick husks. The kernels are tiny seeds. Yet long before Columbus arrived, that wild grass had managed to evolve into maize and spread across North America. Corn spread because it could adapt to the needs of human beings. Of course, it needed human help. Humans selected bigger ears with fatter kernels and planted those seeds. By the year 1700, Indians as far away as New England and Canada farmed maize. Corn had begun its march to world denomination, but still had a long way to go. After Columbus, the Native Americans were conquered by the Europeans, but maize or corn had no loyalties to the, to the Maya and the other people who helped it spread. It was only concerned with its own survival. The Europeans presented a way for corn to spread even further. The plant quickly adapted to the new humans and their needs. The first thing corn did was push aside the European crops the settlers brought with them. The European plants just couldn't compete. For example, wheat brought from Europe did not do as well as the native maize. A seed of wheat might, with luck, yield 50 new grains of wheat. A single planted corn could yield 150 to 300 fat kernels. Corn won the contest easily. Corn continued to quickly to win over new settlers by being very useful. It could supply them with a ready-to-eat vegetable, a storable grain, a source of fiber, an animal feed, and heating fuel. Corn could be eaten fresh off the cob or dried to the stalk, stored over the winter, and ground into flour. Corn could also be mashed and fermented to make beer or whiskey. No part of the big grass went to waste. The husk could be woven into rugs and twine, the leaves and stalks made good feed for the livestock. The shelled cobs could even be stacked by the outhouse and used as a rough stub substitute for toilet paper. In the competition for the king of the crops, corn left the European plants in the dust. Settlers who stuck to the old world crops often perished. The colonists who recognized 
corn's usefulness did well. And of course, one thing the successful farmers did was plant more corn, helping maize build its kingdom. Corn helped the colonists and the colonists helped corn. Corn made itself self useful in, other important way, in another important way. It turned out that corn was an excellent way to store and trade well. Dried corn is easy to transport and almost indestructible. The farmer can take any surplus to market and sell or trade it. In the colonies, corn often took the place of money. Corn allowed farming settlements to become trade settlements. Corn made the slave trade possible. Traders in Africa paid for slaves with corn and then fed slaves corn when they were brought here. Corn was the perfect plant for the growing economy of the colonies. And just as important, the new colonists gave corn a way to get, the rest, to, get to the rest of the world. Food Detective. Once I realized how much of our food is made from corn, I began to look at the supermarkets differently. Instead of a giant variety of food, I saw corn hiding in every aisle. Now, I have nothing against corn. There's nothing more delicious than a roasted ear of fresh, sweet corn. But I didn't understand why there had to be corn in everything we eat. Who decided that corn would be our main food? How did that happen? Where did all this corn come from and how did it take over our supermarket? So I decided to find out. And like any good detective, I realized I had to start at the very beginning, which in this case meant a field of corn in Iowa. I began with that field and tried to trace the corn as it traveled across the country, first to my supermarket and then to my stomach. I watched it being turned into meat, milk, and eggs by cows and chickens. I watched as it was, it was torn apart and rebuilt into all the different foods and products listed on those labels. What I discovered was a vast industry, a giant agricultural business or agribusiness. This industry doesn't look much like farming the way people imagine it. It's more like a series of factories that turn raw materials into food products. It's a giant food chain, the one that supplies most of the food Americans eat today. A food chain in nature helps us understand who eats what or whom, but the food chain that feeds most Americans is anything but natural. The industrial food chain that supplies our supermarket stretches thousands of miles and has dozens of different lengths. It's a chain that's powered by oil and gasoline and controlled by giant corporations. It's a chain that separates us from our food and keeps us from knowing what it is, what really, what it really is we're eating. Most of all, it's a food chain built around one plant. Somehow, that small wild grass that started in the hills of Central, Amer Central America has become the star of the biggest, most expensive food chain in the history of the world. But if corn is the star of the story, is it the hero or is it the bad guy? Before I could decide, I needed to get to know it better. So I went to see where it lives in the vast cornfields of the Midwest. Okay, guys, um, I had to split them up just because I was worried it would be too long. Um, but here is chapter two, read aloud. The farm, one farmer, 140 eaters. It was the first week of May, and I was at the wheel of a clattering 1975 International Harvester tractor driving through an Iowa cornfield. The tractor was dragging a spidery machine called an eight row planter, which dropped corn seeds into the earth. Driving over the field was like trying to steer a boat through a sea of dark, dark chocolate. The hard part was <clears throat> the hard part was keeping the thing on a straight line. If you mess up, your rows will wobble, overlapping, or spreading apart. Your neighbor will laugh, and worst of all, you will not be able to plant as much corn. The tractor I was driving belonged to George Naylor, a big man with a moon face and a scraggly gray beard. He sat next to me as I drove and tried to shout instructions over the diesel roar. He had on the farmer's usual baseball cap, a yellow shirt, and overalls, the stripy blue kind worn by railroad workers. The field was part of Naylor's farm, 470 acres in Greene County, Iowa. Naylor had been working the farm for more than 30 years since he took it over from his father in the mid-1970s. 
This part of Iowa has some of the richest topsoil on the, in the world, a layer nearly two feet thick. It was laid down over 10,000 years ago by retreating glaciers. Tall grass prairie grew here until the mid 1800s when the sod was first broken by the settler's plow. George's grandfather moved his family to Iowa from Der Derbyshire, England in the 1880s. The sight of such soil curling behind the blade of his plow must have made him feel happy and confident. It's gorgeous stuff, black gold as deep as you can dig as far as you can see. The far end of the food chain. Back in 1919, when the nailers bought this land, farming was very different and so was the nailer farm. All sorts of crops grew here, corn, but also fruits and other vegetables, as well as oats, hay, and alfalfa to feed the pigs, cattle, chickens, and horses. Horses were the tractors of that time. Back then, one out of every four Americans lived on a farm. The average farmer grew enough food to feed 12 other Americans. Less than a century later, the picture is very different. Corn has muscled out most of the other plants and animals. The sheep, chickens, pigs, and horses are gone. So are most of the fruits and vegetables. George Naylor grows only two crops on his 470 acres, corn and soybeans. Corn has even pushed out, pushed most people off the farm. Out of the 300 million Americans, only 2 million are still farmers. That means the average American farmer today grows enough food to feed 140 other people. The 140 people who depend on George Naylor for their food are all strangers. Like me, they live at the far end of a food chain that is long and complicated. George Naylor doesn't know the people he is feeding, and they don't know him. I came to the Naylor farm as an unelected representative of the 140 people he feeds. I was curious to learn whom and what I'd find at the far end of the food chain that keeps me alive. Of course, I had no way of knowing if it was George or some other farmer who grows the corn that feeds the steer that becomes my steak. That's the nature of the industrial food chain. But I knew that a Midwest cornfield, just like George Naylor's, is the, is the place most of our food comes from. I plant corn. The day I showed up at the farm was supposed to be the only dry one all week and George was trying to get his last 160 acres of corn planted. A week or two later, he'd start in on the soybeans. The soybean has become the second major crop in the industrial food chain, taking turns each year in the field with corn. It now finds its way into two thirds of all processed foods. For most of the afternoon, I sat on a rough cushion George had made, made for me from crumpled seed bags. After a while, he let me take the wheel. We drove back and forth across the field, a half a mile in each direction. Every pass across this field, which is almost perfectly flat, represents another acre of, of corn planted. The corn seed we were planting looked like regular kernels of corn, but it was actually something called Pioneer Hybrid 34H31. You and I think of corn as corn, but farmers like Naylor know there are dozens of varieties, most created by large agribusiness companies. That's one of the reasons corn has succeeded so well. It's relatively, it's relatively easy for humans to breed new types of corn to fit our needs. But what's good for corn and agribusiness isn't always good for farmers. That's the case with the new types of corn seed. Back when George's grandfather started farming, farmers grew their own seeds. That's the way farmers had always gotten their seed. They just kept some of their crop to be planted for the next season. Then in the 1930s, seed companies came up with a new kind of corn seed, hybrid corn. A hybrid is a plant or animal whose parents have different traits. For example, you might take a type of corn that resists disease and cross it with another type of corn that produces a lot of ears. The result is a hybrid, a disease resistant plant that produces a lot of corn. Sounds good, right? The catch is that that hybrid corn does not always come true. The first crop planted from hybrid corn seed will all be identical. The plants will all have good traits the seed company promise, 
but the children of that crop will be mixed. Some plants will be like their hybrid parents, but most will not. The only way to make sure your plants produce the same amount of corn, that they have the same yield as the original hybrid, is to buy new seeds every year from a seed company. Hybrid corn quadrupled the yields of farmers from about 20 bushels per acre to about 80 bushels per acre. This was the beginning of a major change in the way farmers operated and the way we get our food. In a way, it was the beginning of the industrial food chain. The secret of modern corn hybrids is that they can be planted very close together. Before farmers, before hybrids, a farmer could plant 8,000 corn plants in an acre. Today, George can grow 30,000 plants in an acre. Hybrids have been bred for thicker stalls, stalks, and stronger root systems. The better to stand upright in a crowd. This also makes it possible to harvest them with a large machine. Basically, the plants live in a city of corn crowded together in neat rows. New hybrids have increased farm yields to about 180 bushels per acre. One bushel holds 56 pounds of kernels, so 180 bushels is slightly more than 10,000 pounds of food per acre. The field George and I planted that day would produce 1.8 million pounds of corn. Not bad for a day's work sitting down, I thought to myself. Franken seeds? When farmers first planted hybrid corn in the 1930s, their yields doubled or tripled. But if they planted seed from that first crop, yields dropped again since the second generation of corn was not identical to the first. The only way to get the higher yields was to buy seed from seed companies. Soon, the only way for a farmer to compete was to buy hybrid seed every year. Even if farmers faced hard times, the seed companies continue to make money year after year, selling farmers something they used to grow themselves. Today, the seed companies have taken things a step further genetically modified corn seed or GMO for a genetically modified organism promises even higher yields than hybrid seed. GMO corn is not bred the old fashioned way by crossing corn plants. It is created in a laboratory by adding genes to corn DNA. The genes don't come back from corn plants. They might come from a bacteria or some other organism. So with human help, Corn can now take genes from other plants and animals. This opens up a whole new world of possibilities for the plant and its breeders. These new GMO seeds could be a bonanza, bonanza for the seed companies. No one can own the species called corn. It is part of the natural world, the common property of all humanity. But with GMOs, a company can own a patent on a living organism. When Mon Monsanto or some other corporation invents a new type of corn, it belongs to them, and they can charge farmers for the right to grow it. But many farmers, like George Naylor, refuse to grow GMO crops. They believe that GMOs are a reckless experiment with the natural order of things.